Good morning. Welcome, friends, to this worship service coming to you from the First Presbyterian Church here in Newton, New Jersey, on this 11th day of October, the second Sunday in October. Uh, among other things, today we will be celebrating our Bucket Brigade, and uh, Colleen Duffy, my associate, will tell you more about that very soon. In the meantime, there is information found on our website, and it's in print down below me. And uh, so the worship guide and other information about the church is available there. Certainly hope that you will um, be connected with us in that way. At this time, let us uh, prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Please join with us in the call to worship found in this morning's worship guide. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who and made heaven, heaven and earth. earth. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call, call upon, upon him, him while he is near. near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and, and the unrighteous their thoughts. thoughts. And let them return to the Lord, for, for he, he will, will abundantly pardon. pardon. And to our God, that he might have mercy upon them. Let us worship God. Our opening song is All Creatures of Our God and King, and we will sing three verses of this, what I think is a pretty well-known hymn. <laughs>
invite you to join with us in the prayer of the day as together we pray. Merciful God, in Jesus Christ, you do not call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Draw us away from the easy road that leads to destruction and guide us into paths that lead to a life abundant. In seeking your truth and obeying your will, May we know the joy of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our psalm for the day is, I'm guessing again, fairly well known, Psalm 23, which we will read responsively. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Hello, everyone. This is our time with children, and I'm Mrs. Duffy. And I am so glad you are joining us for virtual worship because I really wanted someone to celebrate with me today. You see, I'm all ready to celebrate. Got my party hat on, I have balloons, and I even have a lay, or a couple lays. Now, I bet you are wondering why I have all these things here. You probably think it's my birthday, don't you? But it's not. Maybe it's a holiday. I don't think so. So why is today so special? Well, God tells us that every day is special. In our scripture passage this morning, in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, Paul writes, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now rejoicing is to feel great joy or delight. And Paul is telling us to rejoice always. He doesn't say to rejoice and celebrate only when it's your birthday or just on holidays or just when something happy or something fun happens. No, he tells us to rejoice and to celebrate always. And you know what? Paul wrote this letter where he tells us to rejoice, reminding us to rejoice in God while he was in prison in Rome. So we need to rejoice in the Lord, even on boring days or days when things are just not going our way. We need to rejoice in the Lord when we are frightened and when we are sad and when we're worried or even when we're happy. We should rejoice in the Lord always because God loves us. God provides for us. God protects us and God promises to always be with us. Paul is in prison, and he's still rejoicing in God. And he is rejoicing with him because he knows that God is with him and that God loves him. And God loves each one of us, too. Now, that's a pretty amazing gift that God gives us each and every day. And that's why every single day we have a reason to rejoice. Now, our activity for today is to make a rejoice in the Lord tambourine. Sorry, parents. The supplies needed are simple. Two paper plates, some markers or colored pencils or crayons, a stapler, about an eighth of a cup of dried peas or beans, and a glue stick. Oh, and you need a copy of the Rejoicing in the Lord coloring page. Now, you can find the template for the coloring page as well as the instructions for making the tambourine on the, in this week's Beacon newsletter. And if you did not receive a copy of that newsletter in your email box, you will find a copy on our church website. Now, this is a great activity for our preschool and our early elementary school children. And don't just make that tambourine, use it too. 
The beacon also includes a few YouTube links to great children's songs about praising God. So sing along while playing your tambourine. Older elementary children might read Paul's entire letter to the church in Philippi. It's a short, short book and it's only four chapters long, but it's filled with really important teachings, including how to live as a good Christian or how to live a humble life and how to be at peace. Maybe read a chapter each evening and talk together as a family about how to live out these teachings. Whatever you choose to do, remember to rejoice in the Lord always, for God has given us so much to be joyful about. Let's pray. Gracious God, you give us so many reasons to rejoice, and yet we often forget to do that. Help us to remember to rejoice in you every day and always. Amen. Thank you, Colleen. The passage to which Colleen referred comes to us from the book of Philippians, from the fourth chapter, and I'll be reading the first nine verses. Let's continue to listen for God's word. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I also ask you, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Did Mona Lisa ever frown? We can imagine she probably did, but we wouldn't know for sure because all we have is that painting of her with that iconic smile and then somewhere in the back recesses of our minds, we might be hearing Nat King Cole singing Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa. Well, speaking about ears, what about poor Vincent van Gogh? You know, he's forever looking back at us in that self-portrait where he has one of his ears bandaged up because he tried to cut it off, do you remember? In your mind's eye, you probably have and can picture your favorite vac vacation spot. Do you have it there? Now tell me, what's the weather like? Tell me, is it ever raining when we have that picture of that perfect place in our heads? I doubt it. Or let's try this. What about, uh, was there ever a kid in your school class who got caught cheating or, or doing something else that maybe it only happened once, but then that became who that person was, in a sense that we're branded with that memory. Or perhaps you've been caught doing something particularly noble and someone saw it and forever after that's their image of you. Now maybe you are a great person, hopefully most of the time, but even so, you might get a little embarrassed if they, all they can remember is that event and every time they're with them, that's the thing that they're remembering. Well, we can each use our mind's eyes to 
capture images and pictures of our past, and these can become the, the sum total of that person or of that place or of that experience. These, let's call them freeze frames, they cancel out all other information, either to the contrary, good or bad. They lock things into a, a set, unchanging perspective. People get placed on pedestals or they get consigned to the cellar, often based on scanty evidence and incomplete information. We've done it to others. We've had it done to us. Politicians are past masters at doing it to each other. Sometimes, however, things happen that force us to change our opinion of others or of their opinion of us. But unfortunately, many other times, the picture remains frozen and unchanging in spite of all efforts to change it out. Well, this leads me to Paul's letter. And in Paul's letter, he's going to mention two women, Deodia and Syntyche. Deodia and Syntyche. He calls them co-workers in the church. He urges them to be of the same mind. We don't know what the situation was. Presumably there was a disagreement of some kind or another. And we never hear whether it got resolved. And now, 2,000 years later, it's as though these two women have been caught in a freeze frame fight. They've been talked about for years argued over and urged over and over again to, to work it out, resolve their differences, kiss and make up. But year after year after year, the disagreement continues. And Paul, for his part, is interrupting his letter to speak of them by name and to urge unity for the sake of the gospel. He's willing to name names for the purpose of moving them toward reconciliation. And he's reminding the folks in Philippi, and oh, by extension, us as well, that this current disagreement between Aeodia and Sitike is not the sum total of their identities. He says, they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. I love that. Aeodia and Sitike co-workers. Are they indeed co-workers, or are they going to be forever at odds? We can only hope that their differences were resolved, and that the church also is challenged by Paul's letter to work harder for unity in Jesus' name. For after all, it is the same Jesus who warns us against judging others. It's this same Jesus He's the one who scandalizes conventional wisdom about forgiveness by saying, well, I tell you, not, not seven times, but you ought to forgive seven times, 70 times, seven times. This Jesus, he's the one who, he won't let something even as permanent as death get the last word. And he calls us to live in the light of gospel hope here and now, today. It's Paul's firm faith in the power of the resurrection that gives him the courage to encourage others to change. And remember, it's this same Paul who himself, earlier in his life, he refused to change his opinion about Jesus, and it took God knocking him off his horse to knock some sense into him and to then set him on a path of Christian mission. It's this Paul who offers words of encouragement from an attitude of rejoicing. For Paul, the knowledge of God's love and forgiveness is enough to lead him to rejoice over and over again. And again I say, rejoice. He wants to take us there too. To remind us that we do not have to live in a perpetual state of despair or frustration or anger. We do not have to write others off or cut them out of our lives. Rather, we need to learn how to, how to deal with our differences honestly and openly, melting that, that frozen state of relationships so that God's love can move and flow freely in and amongst us 
and out into the world around us. If Paul were writing today, and in a sense he is, and if he were writing to First Presbyterian Church here in Newton, and again, in a sense he is, what would he have to say to us? Who among us would he be urging to be of the same mind? Who among us would he be enlisting to assist in the important work of reconciliation and peacemaking? Who among us would he be calling us to remember is also a brother or a sister in Christ, one for whom Christ died? And would his words have the power to change hearts and minds enough to melt the frosty edges of the freeze frame that we've placed around some of the portraits that are hanging in our own personal robes gallery? You know, I believe God is not by any means finished with us yet. And I believe that Christ died for sinners like me and sinners like you and also sets us free for new beginnings and new life. I believe the church is gathered in for, for feasting, not for fighting. So, if my name is Yeodia and your name is Syntyche, can we hear Paul urging us to a greater unity for Christ's sake? Or do we remain locked in this freeze frame, never addressing the issues, unwilling to acknowledge that we're both on the same gospel-promoting team? And what will melt the frame? Will it help if we take the rest of Paul's advice to heart? When we focus upon the things that are worthy of our attention, and he lists some of them, Things that he mentions are things that are, are true and honorable and just and pure and pleasing and commendable and excellent and worthy of praise instead of all of their opposites. That's when Paul says, the God of peace will be with us. What would it look like for us actively to focus upon these things and upon the unity that is already ours in Christ? And how might our witness to the world be strengthened and enhanced? Well, these are some of the questions that come to my mind as I, I wonder whether Yodia and Syntyche and their church in Philippi ever let go of their disagreements so that they could take a firmer hold upon the rejoicing that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I wonder whether we modern-day Yodias and Syntyches can do the same. Let us pray. Remind us, O oh God, that in your word is a lively word, not just written to people way back when, but it resonates in our lives and in our hearts. We pray that your spirit would open a, a, an opportunity in us that your words might take root and grow and blossom and bear good fruit, fruit for the kingdom, fruit that will last, fruits of reconciliation and peacemaking and forgiveness and love and all for Jesus' sake, in whose name we pray. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Friends, we're going to sing another song. And this comes to us out of our newer, uh, it's called Sing the Faith Songbook, and the song is called Change My Heart, O God, and we'll sing it through once. Change my heart, oh God. May 
announcements to share today and one of those is that um, we have received approval of our plan to return to worshiping here indoors in the sanctuary um, there are lots of bits and pieces to that and the plan will be posted on our website and also mailed out to members to take a look at and become used to when we're back in worship together uh, masks will be required at all times. There are other things. Singing will not be happening, out loud that is. Um, unison prayers will not happen. Uh, we're going to be as, as safety conscious as possible, even as we rejoice in regathering here in this place. And at this point, we're looking for a start date of October 25th, which corresponds with Reformation Sunday, the last Sunday in October. And um, we will be sending out, as I say, more information about that in the near future, but we're moving toward that as our plan, and that will be at 10 a.m. It'll be one service, 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. This will change the start time of when our, our services will be available online, because we'll continue to do that, but they won't start at 7 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Rather, it'll be sometime after that 10 a.m. worship service time. So so glad you've been with us in these other times as we've been necessarily doing this virtual service but looking forward also to returning into this place and uh, to greeting you at that time colleen you'll find information about our church's ministries as well as opportunities to gather right now virtually for bible study for prayer and for times of fellowship in our weekly Deacon newsletter, and you can find that on our church website. There is one opportunity that I would like to highlight for you this morning, and it takes place on Sunday, October 18th at 12.30 p.m. at the Long Meadow Farm in Blairstown. And it is our hope that this activity will make a difference in our community by gleaning apples for local share. Now, local share is an organization that gleans farm fresh foods from local farms and then distributes them to soup kitchens, food pantries, and shelters, making sure it is available to any family that might have a need. So if you would like to join us, just call the church office and let us know that you plan to attend with us. Um, we need to have the information in case we get canceled for inclement weather and as well for the farm so that they know how many orchards to put us in. Now today is the second Sunday of the month um, and our tradition here at First Presbyterian Church is Bucket Brigade on the second Sunday of the month where we collect our loose change to help fight hunger in our communities. Your continued generosity toward the Bucket Brigade, even when we have not yet been able to gather together in our sanctuary for worship, has helped to make a world of difference for those in our area that are struggling with food insecurities during this time of pandemic and job loss and underemployment. So you can continue to give electronically on our church website, or you can even mail a check directly to our church office. Just be sure to mark it Bucket Brigade. Thank you. The God of heaven and earth and of all creation holds each one of us in tender love and care. God is gracious and good, and no one is insignificant in God's eyes. So we respond to everything that God is doing in the life of the world by offering a portion of what we have been generously received from God, from a loving God. We offer our gifts in gratitude and in praise. Please join with me as we sing together the sung response of thanksgiving.
God, the first offering you ask is for the giving of ourselves, loving you and others boldly, refusing to let our fear of the storms around us keep us from taking risks. Forgive us for the times when you have called us to leave our places of comfort and we've ignored your call. Forgive us when our giving has not grown beyond our safety zone, but you blessed our gifts anyway. For all this, we give thanks in the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. As we come to a time of our morning prayers, the prayer list was mailed out, and uh, also let me make note of uh, some aspects of that list. We are celebrating the birth of, G of uh, Jillian Page, born on September 27th. Wendy is recovering from knee surgery, and also wanted to thank everyone for their strong prayer support. There have been some losses in our community and the larger community as well, and we are uh, mourning the death of Dr. George Gray. This is Bill Gray, a member of our church, Bill Gray's brother, and George passed away on September 19th. Also remembering Marianne Langley, she was uh, uh, died on October 1st, and service for Marianne was held yesterday. Also, um, Nancy Smith, a longtime member of this congregation, passed away on October 3rd, and the service for Nancy was held this past Thursday. There are others in, in need of our prayers, of course, both locally and by extension, wherever the people of God are in trouble or in fear or in doubt or uh, worried about uh, storms, uh, what be they from fires or from hurricanes and or from COVID, whatever is currently the concern there, we certainly uh, lift all up in our prayers this day. And for our prayers at this time, we'll be using again what's called a bidding prayer, which is to say, after various aspects of our prayer life are lifted up, if you hear the words, merciful God, you're invited to respond, hear our prayer. So let us pray. Holy God, you have blessed humanity with understanding and the ability to choose the good. Give to all leaders and people a vision of your world made whole, the wisdom to pursue it, and the will to accomplish it. Merciful God, hear our prayers. O Lord God, you have given your world the gift of Jesus to transform our suffering into healing and hope. Be with all who suffer hardship, distress, or need, and help us to honor you by serving together as we grow in the mercy and compassion of Christ. Merciful God, Amen. hear our prayer. O Lord God, you blessed us with the gift of creation and call us to uphold its purpose of declaring your holy splendor. Join us with the Spirit's movement in caring for your world as together we await our redemption from glory into glory. Merciful God, hear Amen. our prayer. We give you thanks for the gift of hope that never ends and that we are more than victors through him who loved us. We remember all who have died and we give you thanks, O oh God, that nothing can separate us from you. You have received our loved ones into the arms of your compassion and into the realms of glory. We thank you for the ways in which they have made an impact upon us, have molded us and mentored us and loved us. As we lift up the names of those who are now with you in glory, we pray, merciful God, hear our prayer. And as this political season continues to heat up, as we make our way toward the day of polling and election, oh God, we pray for all of our people in this area and around the country, and by extension around the globe, who will be casting ballots. 
We pray for those who are aspiring to high office, those who are wishing to continue there. We ask that you would watch over each and every one. Keep us safe. Keep us whole. Keep us as people of peace. Even as the sounds get louder and the cacophony seems to overwhelm, help us to hear still your small voice through it all, calling us reminding us, guiding us forward in paths of justice and of peace for Jesus' sake. Merciful God, hear our prayer. Lord God, accept these, the prayers of our hearts, both spoken and unspoken, which we offer up in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends in Christ, thank you again for being with us for this service of worship. We hope it has been a blessing for you, even as we have enjoyed sharing this time together. And so, after receiving the benediction, we will um, be singing one verse of a song that we started using last week. And if I can get my pages to turn, I'll know what that is. Not that I didn't know, but you know what I'm saying. It's called Called as Partners in Christ's Service, Called to Ministries of Grace. And part of this reminded me of Yodia and Syntyche. May we learn the art of sharing side by side and friend with friend, equal partners in our caring to fulfill God's chosen end. So brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the abiding presence of God's Holy Spirit, may it rest upon us this day. May it lead us to rejoice. And again I say, rejoice, because the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. Read that book of Philippians. There's great stuff in that Paul reminds us that we have so many reasons to give thanks and praise and always in Jesus' name. And let all God's people say, Amen.